shooter, Debbie Massey, a two-shot advantage. She's made them all week, guys. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Debbie Massey, and I'm a touring pro with the Ladies Professional Golf Association. I'm honored to endorse this tape because I feel that understanding the rules and etiquette of golf is crucial for anyone who plays the game. You've just made the most important step in becoming a better golfer. By watching this video, you will learn the many aspects of this challenging, sometimes frustrating, and enjoyable game. It covers everything you need to know and answers the many questions you've been afraid to ask. So watch it, use it, and enjoy. Hello, my name's Helene Landers. I'm an LPGA professional, and I'd like to welcome you to the beautiful Hacienda Golf Course here in La Habra Heights, California and introduce you to the wonderful world of golf. This video does not teach you swing mechanics because I believe that only personal hands-on instruction from a certified professional can teach you that. Rather, it teaches you all about actually playing the game. It covers the basic rules and etiquette and the other important details that are so crucial to know when playing golf. Those things that everyone expects you to know but no one ever teaches you and you're too embarrassed to ask. Remember, in this sport, unlike other sports, your play is judged based more on your knowledge and understanding of the rules and etiquette rather than your actual ball striking ability. In golf, sportsmanship and courtesy are number one. After watching this videotape, you'll be equipped with the necessary knowledge to avoid making those critical mistakes which seasoned golfers find so offensive and can mark the difference between both making a deal and making friends on the course. We'll follow along a match between four women and analyze their playing knowledge of the rules and etiquette. The first thing you'll want to do when arriving to the course is drop your clubs off at the bag drop area. Most private clubs and resorts will usually have a parking lot or bag attendant, a locker room attendant, and someone who will clean your clubs at the end of the round. It's customary to tip each of them $1 to $2 depending on their service. And at private clubs, it's not a good idea to change your shoes in the parking lot. Do it in the ladies' locker room and leave your shoes in your host locker or under one of the changing benches. Leave your purse in the locker or in your car, too. And also, you can usually only wear your spikes in certain parts of the clubhouse so be sure to note where those places are. There's Melanie. She'll be playing with us today. She's a businesswoman, very focused on her career, and she sees the value that golf can add to her list of contacts. Hi, Melanie. Hi, Helene. Ready for the big game today? I'm a little nervous. That's OK. There's nothing to be nervous about. But I'm a new player, and all the other women are going to be so much better than I am. No, they won't. They'll hit their share of bad shots, too. Just concentrate on your key swing thoughts and keep it focused, and you'll be fine. Well, I came down the driving range a little early so I could practice. Maybe that'll loosen me up. It'll sure help. See you later. OK, see you in a bit. Let's watch Melanie warming up. Melanie's putting her golf glove on her left hand because she's a right-handed player. A golf glove helps you get a firmer grip on the club and helps prevent blisters. Some women will wear a glove on both hands to protect their hands from the sun. Your glove should fit snugly on your hand. You don't want any loose materials or gaps that will hinder your feel of a club. But you also don't want it so tight that it cuts off your circulation. Golf gloves are sized small, medium, and large, and also cadet sizes for smaller fingers. Soft leather gloves will loosen up a bit after time. To keep your glove from drying out, you should keep it in a separate plastic bag. If you have long fingernails, you might consider a glove with cut-off fingertips to prevent constantly tearing holes in the fingers and to give you a better fit through the hand. Melanie's done a couple of stretches to loosen up her back, shoulder, and leg muscles. It's important to stretch properly before swinging so you don't pull any muscles, which is very common in golf as your body is twisting in both directions. The stretches Melanie has done are good ones to copy stretching out the back, arms, and legs. Now she's ready to take some nice easy swings to loosen up with a club before she really lets it rip. But first let's talk a little bit about the clubs. 
The rules of golf only allow you to carry a maximum of 14 clubs in your bag. You can carry less if you'd like, but not more. Each club has a grip, a shaft, and a head. The type of head determines whether it's an iron, wood, or putter. And each head has a toe, a heel, and a center, or sweet spot. The clubs differ in length and loft to create shots of different distances. Therefore, you only have to learn one golf swing. It's the club you select which will determine the distance the ball travels. So you don't have to manufacture different swings. Now the sand wedge is the shortest and most lofted club. The loft means the angle of the face pointing towards the sky. Your sand wedge is designed to hit the ball high and short. It's primarily used in sand bunkers and around the greens. Next is the pitching wedge. It's slightly longer and less lofted. It's used predominantly around the greens and will give the beginning golfer about five yards more distance than the sand wedge and about 10 yards more for the more advanced player. This is the amount of distance you should expect to gain between clubs as you move from one club to the other and decrease the loft. So the irons are then numbered nine through one, nine being more lofted and shorter than the eight and so on until you get to the one iron, which is rather long with very little loft. When properly struck, the one iron will hit the ball lower and further than the other irons in your bag. But for most women, the one, two, and three irons are usually too hard to swing and control. So you're better off to carry a few more woods and eliminate those clubs from your set. The woods differ from the irons primarily in the head shape. The head of a wood is bigger and a bit heavier. And this combined with a longer shaft will hit the ball even further. Now the woods are also numbered and most women will carry a seven, a five, three, and a one wood, more commonly called a driver. The numbering sequence is the same as with the irons. The five wood has a slightly larger head and longer shaft than the seven wood, and so on up to the driver, which is the longest club with the biggest head in your bag. This accounts for its distance and hitting difficulty. The term wood is really a misnomer when describing these clubs because there's nothing wood about them anymore. That name has been carried over from when the heads were made of wood. Nowadays, the heads are made of either metal or graphite. The technology in golf has advanced just like in skiing and tennis, going from wood to metal to graphite. The most high-tech club shafts are also now being made out of graphite because it's more lightweight and durable. You can get quite confused with all the different materials on the market when it comes to purchasing your clubs. If you jot down a few notes from this video, you'll be better prepared to ask some educated questions when it comes to purchasing your clubs. Remember that the more high-tech the material is, the more expensive the clubs will be. If you have the money to spend, then I recommend that you buy clubs with graphite shafts and either metal or graphite heads. Just as we all don't have the same foot size, therefore we all don't wear the same size shoe, we shouldn't all be expected to fit into the same size golf club. Your clubs can and should be tailored to fit your specific needs. Big hands versus little hands should have larger or smaller grips to correspond. Your grip should fit so that when you're holding the club in your left hand, your fingertips will be about a quarter of an inch away from your palm. If your fingertips are touching, the grip is too small and vice versa. Now your grip should be tacky for a firmer hold through the swing. They'll get slick, so you'll need to replace them every year or two. Washing them off every so often with shampoo or dish detergent to remove the dirt and body perspiration will help to keep them lasting longer. When purchasing your clubs, seek out the advice of a knowledgeable professional to help fit your clubs to your specific needs. Trying to swing a club that's not fitted for you is like trying to run a marathon in the wrong size shoes. Purchasing a putter is mostly a matter of looks and feel, though you'll want to make sure it's the right size for you. I recommend that you buy a putter which has a line on the center, showing where to strike the ball on the club head. Putting is what you should practice the most, because this is where you can make up a lot of strokes. There's an old saying which goes, drive for show, but putt for the dough. So let's get back to our practice warm-up routine. you 
want to loosen up with your pitching wedge or one of the more lofted clubs and work your way through the clubs from the most lofted through to the least lofted club, taking just a few swings with each. Tracy, who is a real estate broker playing in our group today, has been down here longer than Melanie and is over there hitting a four iron. Once you've gotten control of your swing, then you'll want to move to the woods, starting again with the higher numbered woods and working to the lower numbered ones. Finally concluding with your driver, or whatever club you'll be using off the first tee. Your driver is the longest club and the hardest to hit, so that's the last club you should practice hitting. Never start your practice session with a driver or a wood. Work into it. And always end on a positive note, with a good shot to give you confidence going to the first tee. I've already told you how important putting is to this game, so don't neglect getting on the putting green to practice a few putts. Putting surfaces differ from course to course and day to day, so you'll want to acquaint yourself with how the putts are rolling on that course that day. The practice putting green usually closely resembles the greens on the course in terms of their hardness, grass type, and length. And remember, too, that putts will always break toward water and away from mountains. Susan, our mother in the group, has finished hitting balls and is here on the practice putting green waiting for the rest of us to join her and go play. So let's get to it. Okay. Great shot. Thanks. Kind of scary out there. <laughs> a golf match is an 18-hole competition broken down into two nine-hole competitions, a front nine and a back nine. Each hole has a starting area or teeing ground, the fairway, rough, and putting green with a flag in it marking the hole. The slightly higher grass around the green is called the fringe or apron. The object of the game is to get the ball into the hole in the least amount of strokes. However, this is made difficult with the added obstacles of sand bunkers, water hazards, which are marked by red or yellow stakes, and out of bounds marked by white stakes. The inside edge of the stakes is where the boundary for hazards or out of bounds begins. The ball is not out of bounds unless all of it lies out of bounds. If the flag is not visible from the tee because the hole curves, we call that hole a dog leg, either right or left, depending on which way it curves. As we're getting ready, we can see Tracy with the starter checking to make sure it's all right for us to go out and play. The starter regulates all the play on the course. You should always check in with the starter and be sure that you're always on time for your tee time. Many public courses require advanced reservations in order to play, so check into that before arriving at the course. Let's touch on the subject of proper golf attire. Even though at many courses there's no specific dress code for women, there are those outfits which are more appropriate than others. Traditional golf wear for women is a collared short sleeve shirt with Bermuda length shorts or a skirt or tailored pants. If you want to be taken seriously on the course, being properly dressed is as much a part of traditional golf courtesy as good etiquette. Jeans, cutoffs, and body-bearing clothing are definitely taboo. At some of the more exclusive private clubs, there are specific dress codes for women which you'll want to check on before arriving at the course. Call ahead to find out if there are any clothing restrictions for women. The driver should have her bag directly behind her on the cart. And be sure that the strap is fastened securely. Now, there is a proper way to arrange your clubs in your bag and that is to have the woods towards the handle, which is the higher side of the bag, then your longer irons in the middle section, and your shorter irons and your putter at the opposite side of the bag, which is the shortest section and is designed to fit these clubs. Keeping your clubs arranged in this way enables you and your caddy to more easily find a certain club. It's a little thing, but it helps to keep play moving. Driving a golf cart is just like driving a car. You have a gas pedal, brake, parking brake, forward and reverse, as well as the key to turn the cart on. Most courses will want you to keep the carts on the cart paths, although at some you can drive the carts on the grass. When this is the case, they usually like you to employ the 90 degree cart rule. This means that you keep the cart on the cart path until you're at a 90 degree angle across from your ball. Then you can cross over onto the fairway to your ball. Remember that golf is about social interactions and social skills, so if you're paired with others that you don't know, be sure to introduce yourself. Melanie, do you know Susan? Hi, Susan. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you.
Do you know Tracy? Yeah. Susan, this is Tracy. Tracy's playing with us today. She's in real estate. You all set for the day? Yeah. You okay? Okay. Great. So these guys are still here. We're going to have to wait a little bit. So while we've got some time, let's take a look at our scorecard and see what we're facing. Usually the information pertaining to women is on the lower portion of the scorecard. We're on hole number one. It's a 369 yard par four. 369 yards means that's how long the hole measures from the starting area to the center of the green. So if the flag is in the front of the green, the hole won't play as long and vice versa. Par four means that it should take an accomplished golfer only four shots to get the ball in the hole, with two of those shots being allocated as putts. The holes are rated either a three, four, or five par. The length and difficulty of the hole determines its par. The sum total of all the pars for all 18 holes determines the par for the course. This course is a par 72 for women. That's the number we're all trying to attain or beat. If you shoot one less than par on a hole, that's called a birdie. Two less than par is an eagle. One over par is a bogey. Then there's double bogey, triple bogey, and quadruple bogey as well. And of course, we all know what a hole in one is. The number nine here in the handicap area means that this is the ninth most difficult hole on the course. And this handicap area is where you write in your own handicap, which we'll get into later at the end of the tape. For handicap purposes, one person keeps the official score and the other will attest the scorecard. It's also not a bad idea to keep your own score as well. The layout of the hole is also oftentimes shown on the scorecard to give you an idea of where water, sand, and out of bounds are on the hole. That information can also be found at the tee box area, usually around the ball washer. The tee box area at the start of each hole is where you're required to begin. This is the only place where you're allowed to place the ball on a tee. Although as a beginner, I recommend that you hit the ball off of a tee all the way till you get near the green to make it easier to hit. Tee the ball up so that the top of your club lines up to the middle of the ball. The red tee markers are where the women hit from, the whites are for the men, and the blues are for the pros. You are required to tee the ball up between and behind the markers. Teeing the ball up in front of the markers will cost you a two-stroke penalty. Now your body can be outside or in front of the markers, but not the ball. And there's a two club length range behind the markers where you're allowed to tee the ball up. So there's sort of a box area here where you can tee it up. You should announce the name and number on your ball to your group to ensure that no one else is playing the same ball. If this is the case, make a mark on the ball to identify it as yours. That way everyone knows what ball to look for in case you happen to lose your ball, and which ball is yours in the case of a controversy. Now you're not allowed to change your ball during the play of a hole unless the ball becomes badly cut or damaged. But to do this, you must ask your fellow players and announce what ball you're changing to. There are many different brands and types of balls on the market, each one claiming to produce certain results. Basically, what you should know about the golf ball is that it can be made with two different types of covers, either a hard surlin material, which is durable and doesn't cut very easily, or a softer bolata cover, which cuts easier but can give you more feel. The inside of a golf ball is either a two-piece solid core center, which will roll further and give you more distance or a liquid center encased in rubber and then wound with rubber string to make the ball more workable and responsive around the greens because this ball is easier to spin. The tightness with which the rubber string is wound around the liquid center determines the compression of the ball. Wound golf balls are either 80, 90, or 100 compression and this number describes how much pressure is needed by the club to compress the ball and make it fly. An 80 compression ball doesn't require as much swing or club head speed to get it airborne as a 90 or 100 compression ball does. The two-piece hard center balls don't have any compression rating because they have no elasticity or molding capability. There are dimples which are cut into a golf ball to make it aerodynamically efficient when it flies through the air because this decreases friction to produce maximum distance. There are different dimple patterns for different playing conditions but this isn't something that you need to concern yourself with at this point. 
Most importantly, you'll want to play a ball with a Serling cover for maximum durability and a hardcore center for maximum distance and width. If you choose to play a wound ball, play an 80 or 90 compression ball, depending on your ability. Being knowledgeable about the various golf products on the market will enable you to choose equipment best suited to your game, which is as important as a functional swing. Okay, let's set up the game. What are your handicaps? Tracy? I'm a 20. A 20, you sandbagger. Uh, believe me, I play to it. Susan? I'm a 30. Okay, and Melanie? I don't know what the highest there is, 40? 40. You're a 40 and I'm a scratch. Here we've established the game and our handicaps. As we're getting ready to play, notice how the women are getting prepared with everything they need to play with. Be prepared so that when it's your turn, you'll be ready to go. And remember, mooching from your partners is inconsiderate and poor etiquette. Thank you. Well, I might as well go since uh, I can hit that far. Yeah, you can go ahead. So on the first tee, usually the shortest hitter will go first. You'll decide this amongst yourselves, or whoever's ready can go first, as long as the group ahead is out of range. From there on out, the person with the lowest score on the previous hole has the honor and will tee off first. If there's a tie, the teeing order is carried over from the previous hole. However, if you're playing with friends, it's a good idea to play ready golf to keep play moving. This means whoever's ready hits. We've decided that Melanie should go first because she doesn't hit it that far yet. So the group ahead is out of her range. In social golf, you may decide among your group to play a mulligan. A mulligan is similar to the first serve-in rule in tennis, and that is that if you don't like your first drive off the first tee, you can take a second free shot and not count the first one. However, this is not a stipulated rule and is something that the whole group should agree to. In order to keep play moving, we've decided not to play mulligans. Notice where the others are standing when Melanie hits her shot. They're to the side rather than behind her. Standing behind her puts you in her peripheral vision, and your slightest movement could distract her. This is why you want to remain extremely still and quiet when others are hitting. Believe me, golfers will blame their bad shot on anything, and you don't want to give them any reason to blame you, or they probably will. Also notice how they keep their bags, pull carts, and carts off to the side of the tee box. Always leave your clubs off to the side of the teeing area. Melanie has announced her ball, teed it up. Don't forget to make sure it's behind the markers. Lines up her shot, takes one practice swing, being careful not to hit the ground, and oops, hits the ball off the tee by mistake. She can re-tee that without counting a penalty stroke because she hadn't made a real attempt to hit the ball with a downward motion in her swing. However, if she were anywhere else on the course and her club accidentally moved the ball, or the ball moved a little bit when she put her club down behind it, that would count as a one-stroke penalty, and she would have to replace the ball back to its original spot, then play it from there. Now here, she did make an attempt to hit the ball and completely missed it. That stroke does count, and she has to try again. Well, she's hit a pretty good shot, but a little bit left. Well, I think it's over there by that tree. Always make sure to keep watching your ball until it lands and mark it near a landmark. We've marked Melanie's ball near the fifth tree. Also, be courteous enough to watch the other's ball so you can help search for theirs as well. Melanie has hit her trusty five iron off the tee because she's not as accomplished with her woods yet and doesn't feel as confident using them. There's no rule that says you have to use your driver off the tee. You can use whatever club you'd like. Don't forget your divot and tee. Don't forget to take your tee with you and always repair your divot. Repair your divot by replacing and stepping on the misplaced piece of sod, or fill in the hole with the sand and seedling mixture provided on the tee or in your cart. As Susan gets up to hit her ball, notice how she's teed her ball up in a different location than Melanie. She feels she has a better angle to her target from the right. Don't be a creature of habit. Play your own game and make your own decisions. It's best to tee your ball up on the side where the danger is located and hit away from it. In this case, the danger is the out of bounds on the right, so she's teed it up on the right and aims left. Notice her pre-shot routine. She's announced her ball, picked her target, and lines up her shot. Takes her one practice swing, then hits away. Good etiquette means taking only one practice swing per shot, being careful not to take a divot while doing so. Unfortunately, Susan's hit her shot better than she had anticipated and hit it into the group ahead. This is why it's important to make sure that the group ahead is far enough out of the way 
so that even with your best shot, you won't hit into them. However, should this happen, the proper command to yell is four. All golfers understand that this means there's a ball headed their way and to look out. <laughs> now Tracy's ready to hit. She's announced her ball just like the others did, but since she's playing the same kind of a ball as Susan, she's distinguished hers by marking three purple dots on it. Tracy has teed her ball up on the left side, which makes it harder for her to avoid the out of bounds on the right. Uh-oh, looks like that's exactly where she's hit it. Beyond the white stakes on the right side, so it's out of bounds. Susan spotted it near a landmark, so maybe we'll be able to find it. However, since it may be lost, Tracy will put the provisional rule into effect. This means to save time, she'll hit another ball now, so that in case we don't find her first ball, she won't have to come all the way back to the tee and hit again. Her provisional ball will then become her ball in play. She'll have to count her first stroke, then take a penalty stroke for hitting the ball out of bounds, and count her second provisional shot as well. So she'll be lying three at that point. If her first ball isn't out of bounds, she has to play that ball and cannot play her provisional ball. If you do have to hit another ball off the tee, you should do so after everyone else has already hit their first tee shot. While Tracy's getting her second ball, I'll go ahead and hit. I'm using my driver because I've been hitting it well and I want to get the most distance I can. I do my pre-shot routine, line it up, mentally envision the shot, take one practice swing, and hit it towards the target. Ooh, looks like I've hit it right into the bunker. For Tracy's second shot, she's decided to use her three-wood because she has more control over it and to tee it up on the right to hit away from the out-of-bounds. Well, it looks like it worked. That's definitely better. Right down the middle. Thanks. Notice how just after Tracy's hit her ball, these girls are ready to move to their next shot. No dilly-dallying around. Pay attention and always be conscious about keeping play moving. As the women are approaching their shots, let me point out some other important rules of etiquette to keep in mind as you play and to watch for during this tape. Firstly, as a beginner, it's hard not to become self-absorbed on the golf course with so many things to remember combined with your anxiety about hitting the ball. However, try to keep your attention on what's going on around you and on being safe, fast, and courteous. Gain some skill at hitting the ball before you go out on the course and know when to pick up, which should be after about eight to 10 shots or if you're holding up play. Before you go out on a business golf outing, you should be able to shoot about 115 for 18 holes. Be sure to be generous with your compliments and encouragement. Praise a player's good shot based on their definition of good, not yours. The furthest person away from the hole always hits first, so make sure you're the furthest away before you hit. If you're playing ready golf, then make sure it's safe before you hit. And remember that the golf course is a sanctuary of silence, so be still and quiet when others around you are hitting. If your ball is safely out of the way of the player who's hitting, you can help keep play moving by walking towards it, but be sure to stop and look as they're taking their stroke, because you never know where they might hit it. While you're waiting to hit, be constructive. Plan out your shot, take your practice swing, but not while they're hitting, so that you can just step up to the ball and hit it when it's your turn. Don't shoot the ball across fairways. If you happen to hit it into another fairway, let the players playing that hole have the right of way and hit first. Never drive the golf cart close to the greens or tee boxes. Keep your bags and pull carts off the greens as well. When you drive a cart up to a player's ball, always park the cart to the right of a right-handed player and to the left of a left-hander so that the cart is in front of them and not a distraction during their backswing. Let's see how conscientious our group is about practicing proper etiquette on the course. I'll point out some other important rules and etiquette as we're watching them play. However, keep in mind that for the purpose of this tape, we're trying to cover as much information as possible, and all the mistakes you're about to witness don't usually occur all on one hole, or even in one round of golf. Nevertheless, there are situations you're likely to encounter and should be familiar with. Melanie's ball is the furthest away, so she'll hit first. Her ball has landed in a patched up area of the course, surrounded by a white paint line and marked ground under repair. The club doesn't want you hitting on this part of the course because they're trying to do some repair work on it. You're allowed to take a drop outside the painted line without a penalty. When you're taking a drop under the rules, 
you must find the nearest point of relief where the situation is no longer a problem. Mark that with a T, then measure one club length from that area and mark that point with a T. Now she must drop the ball within this area, making sure it doesn't roll closer to the hole. To drop the ball, hold it out at arm's length and shoulder height and let it drop. Now, once she's dropped the ball, she must play it as it lies. It looks like Melanie's dropped her ball right onto a leaf. A dead leaf is a natural but unliving and unattached part of the golf course, so therefore she's allowed to remove it. However, in doing so, she must be careful not to move the ball. Well, it looks like she doesn't have very steady hands or doesn't know the rules because the ball did move when she removed the leaf, and that will cost her a one-stroke penalty. Plus, she must replace the ball back to its original position. Under the rules, the ball is deemed to have moved when it rolls off its axis. If you remove a loose impediment that is anywhere within one club length of your ball and your ball moves, that will cost you a one-stroke penalty. This applies anywhere but on the green. If you're on the green, you can just replace your ball with no penalty. Melanie has replaced her ball, takes her practice swing, and oops, it looks like she didn't hit that very well. Wow, she's not off to a very good start. Her ball hit her bag, which is part of her equipment, and so will cost her another two strokes. This is why it's important to keep your bag or cart out of the way. If she had hit any of the other players, their caddy or equipment, it wouldn't have cost her any strokes, although she would still have to play the ball where it landed. However, since it's her own equipment, she gets penalized. Now she's moved her bag, being careful not to move the ball, into a more out-of-the-way position. And she must play the ball as it lies. She still has the honor because she's still furthest away, so it's still her turn to go. Well, she's made good contact with it, but hit it in the wrong direction. <laughs> Susan is now the furthest away, so now it's her turn. Her ball has rolled up close to the cart path so that when she goes to address her ball, her stance is on the cart path. The cart path is an unnatural man-made part of the course and is considered an obstruction. If the cart path interferes with your play of the ball, either because your ball has rolled onto it or you're forced to stand on it, you can take a free drop from that area with no penalty. Because Susan is familiar with the rules, she's using them to her advantage and dropping her ball where her stance is no longer on the cart path. She finds the nearest point of relief, no closer to the hole, where the cart path no longer interferes with her stance. Measures one club length away, no closer to the hole, holds the ball out arm's length and shoulder height, and drops it within that area. It looks like knowing the rules has worked to Susan's advantage because she's hit a great shot. Let's see what's happening with Tracy's ball. <laughs> well, it's a good thing she hit a second provisional ball because her first shot has gone out of bounds. As you can see, all of the ball is beyond the inside borders of the white stakes. So now she has to play her second ball and count one penalty stroke for going out of bounds. So she now lies three. Unfortunately, someone before us doesn't know proper etiquette and didn't repair their divot. Tracy's the one stuck paying the price for that. Under the rules, she can't move or what we call prefer her lie from that divot hole and must play it as it lies. You'll find, however, that some courses will employ their own local rules. And these are rules made by that club pertaining only to that club and instituted to help protect their course or clarify uncommon situations specific to their course. It's not uncommon to find preferred lies or winter rules as a local rule at seasonal courses. This means, in effect, that you can prefer your ball within one club length of where it lies, but no closer to the hole. However, preferred lies or winter rules is not an official rule of golf, and its meaning may differ from course to course. The local rules for a course will usually be printed on the back of the scorecard. Well, unfortunately, there's not much more you can do from a lie like that. She properly replaces that divot so it can repair itself and will be nice for the other golfers that follow. Not only is it okay to take a divot, it's usually necessary when hitting your shot. Just make sure that you replace it. My ball is in the bunker and has rolled up against a rake, which was placed in the wrong place. The rake should be left to the side in the bunker, not in the middle, with the prongs down, not up. 
Since the rake is an artificial obstruction, I can move it, being careful not to move the ball. If the ball does happen to move, I must replace it back to the exact position where it was. Make sure when you walk into a sand bunker, you do so from the low side and take the rake with you to save time from having to get it later. My ball is also on a leaf. A leaf is considered a natural, loose impediment, and therefore I can't move it in a hazard and must play the ball as it lies. You're allowed to move unnatural obstructions in a hazard, but not natural, loose impediments. You can't take a practice swing in a sand bunker or any other hazard, so take your practice swing outside the bunker. Nor can you touch the sand with anything but your feet before your downswing, or that will cost you two strokes as well. So you must start with the club above the sand. I used my three wood to blast it out. You don't necessarily have to use your sand wedge in the sand, especially if you still have a long distance to go. Remember to always break your foot marks after hitting out of the bunker and leave the rake to the side with the prongs down. Tracy has hit her ball behind a tree. There's a branch in her way, and not thinking, she goes to break it off. That will now cost her two strokes, because you're not allowed to pull or break anything that is fixed or living on the golf course, such as grass, weeds, tree branches, leaves, and such. Objects which are dead, like dead leaves, stones, or twigs, can be moved, as long as you're not in a hazard, and your ball doesn't move when removing them. Tracy's decided that she doesn't have a shot and declared her ball unplayable. This will cost her one stroke, but give her three options. She can either play the ball back at her last shot, drop it two club lengths in any direction but no closer to the hole from the unplayable lie, or drop it on a straight line from the flag through the unplayable spot as far back as she wants. You are the only one who can declare your ball unplayable. You can do so at any time, except if you're in a hazard. Tracy's decided to take a drop. Because a penalty stroke is involved here, when Tracy takes her drop, she's allowed two club lengths distance from the unplayable lie. If no penalty is involved, you're only allowed one club length distance. Well, you can bet at this point Tracy's really peeved at whoever it was that didn't replace their divot. However, like a true golfer, she doesn't show her anger or slam or throw her clubs because she knows it's no fun to play with an immature person. Melanie, on the other hand, has gotten a bit of good luck. Her ball is also behind a tree, but this is a staked tree, so she can take a free drop from there. When trees are staked, they're usually covered by a local rule, which allows you to move your ball without penalty, one club length away, but no closer to the hole, so that you don't injure the new tree by possibly hitting it when you make your swing. Well, Melanie was so anxious about the water down below on her left, that she looked up too soon, her nose exactly where she's hit it. Her good luck has suddenly turned into bad luck. It looks like Susan, again, has marked it near a landmark for Melanie. As a beginner, Melanie gets so caught up with her shot that she forgets to mark where her ball goes. This is a very common problem for beginners, so beware not to fall into that trap. Susan's last shot rolled up near a rope defining where not to drive the golf carts. The rope is in the way of her swing, and it's considered a movable obstruction, so she can lift it out of her way. Good Pretty good shot. She's managed to steer clear of the water. Nice. My ball, like Susan's, has rolled against an unnatural, man-made part of the course and is therefore an obstruction. However, this sprinkler box is immovable, so I can move my ball by taking a free drop. I find the nearest point of relief, no nearer the hole where I can play without interference, mark that spot with a T, then drop the ball within one club length of that point. Since Tracy has gone ahead with the cart and I'm not sure of the yardage or what club I'll need, I've brought a couple of clubs with me to save time from having to go back to the cart and get another club. I've checked the yardage, which is usually imprinted on the sprinkler heads throughout the hole, to help determine what club I'll need. Unless otherwise stated, the yardage markers measure the distance from that particular point to the middle of the green. Well, it looks a little long, but it's still on the green. Notice how I keep looking behind us to see if there's anyone back there that we might be holding up. 
If there was, and we had no one in front of us, we would let them play through by standing off to the side and waving them through. As these women are doing, it's common courtesy and etiquette to help search for a lost ball, as long as it doesn't cause undue delay in hitting your shot. The rules state that if you haven't found your ball after five minutes of searching for it, then it's considered to be lost, and you must count a one-stroke penalty. Go back to the spot where you last played your shot and hit again. Or if you've thought ahead and hit a provisional ball, then that ball would become your ball in play. It looks like Tracy has spotted a ball near the edge of the water, but apparently that's not Melanie. Susan has now spotted a ball which Melanie has retrieved, and this one is hers. She's not quite sure of the rule and, and has asked for clarification on it. This is permissible. However, you're not allowed to ask for advice on how to play the hole or what club to use. Since Melanie's ball had gone into a regular water hazard, which is marked by yellow stakes, she has three options on how to proceed. She can play the ball as it lies, or for a one-stroke penalty, either hit it again from where she last played it, or take it back as far as she wants on the line extending from the flag, through the ball's point of entry into the water, and drop it there, but never closer to the hole. You'll also encounter lateral water hazards on golf courses. A lateral water hazard runs parallel to the fairway and is marked by red stakes. If you hit into a lateral hazard, you have one other option as well, but this will also cost you one stroke. And that is, you may also elect to drop the ball within two club lengths from where it entered the water on either side of the hazard. But of course, no closer to the hole. Melanie can't play her ball where it is. She didn't think to play a provisional ball, so to save time, she's chosen her drop option. She'll drop the ball as far back as she wants behind the hazard on the line where it crossed into the water. She holds it out at shoulder height and arm's length and drops it. She didn't drop it far enough away and it's rolled back into the water. But she can drop it again. Under the rules, it's okay to redrop the ball if it rolls back into or out of the same condition, if it rolls out of bounds, if it rolls nearer to the hole, more than two club lengths out, or next to an immovable obstruction. Well, Melanie has made good contact with the ball, but didn't use the right club and has landed just short of the green. Susan's ball didn't go into the water hazard, but it does look like it's landed in some water that might qualify as casual water. The casual water rule is a good rule to know. Casual water is any temporary puddle of water caused by rain or overwatering, but it's not a water hazard. Only you can declare your ball to be in casual water. It's determined by stepping on the ground, and if the water comes up over the soles of your shoes, then you can employ the casual water option. If either your ball or your stance is in casual water, you can take a free drop within one club length from the nearest point of relief, of course, no nearer the hole. Susan is cleaning the mud off her ball, and that is permissible at this point because she's lifted it to drop it. The only time that you can touch your ball or clean it before it's on the green is when you're taking a drop. Another good shot, but also not enough club, and she's landed short of the green up with Melanie's ball. Susan and Melanie should have checked the sprinkler heads for the correct yardage. Tracy's ball has also landed in casual water. However, hers is in the bunker, which is considered a hazard. Under the rules, she can take relief from that puddle, but she must still drop the ball in the hazard as close as possible to the spot where the ball was that affords her maximum relief but no closer to the hole. She's taken a drop, being careful not to test the sand with her hand or her club. Even though Tracy's ball is closer to the hole than Melanie and Susan, because she's ready and we want to keep play moving, she's going to go ahead and hit. Notice how she takes her practice swing outside the sand and doesn't ground her club on the sand before she hits. Well, her ball's a little long of the flag in green, but at least it's out. On their approach shots to the green, Melanie is further away than Susan, so she'll chip first. That's a pretty good chip. Wait a minute, though. Susan, being the more experienced golfer, always checks her ball before she hits it, and notice that that's not her ball. It's actually Melanie's. Melanie hit the wrong ball. Well, Melanie has to count another two-stroke penalty for playing the wrong ball. Replace Susan's ball and play her correct ball. If you play the wrong ball out of a hazard, you don't have to add a two-stroke penalty, but you must correct your mistake 
and play the right ball. This is why it's important to check your ball before you hit it. This time, Susan hits first, and she too has hit a nice chip. No any second try isn't as good as the first one. Guess it was just beginner's luck. Notice how Tracy has brought her putter with her to save time from having to get it after she chips? Always try to think ahead. Tracy's not quite on the green. Her ball would be considered on the green if any part of it was touching the green. Therefore, she has the option to leave the flag in or take it out for a shot. By leaving it in, there's the possibility that it might help deflect her ball into the hole. <laughs> wow! Just like that, what a lucky shot! Tracy's shot counts, even though she hit Susan's ball, but Susan has to replace her ball back to its original spot. However, if Tracy had been on the green and hit the same shot, she would have to add two penalty strokes to her score, one for hitting Susan's ball and one for hitting the flag stick. It's good practice to mark your ball right away when it lands on the green, whether it's in anyone's way or not. You never know when someone will hit a bad shot. It's also the only time, aside from when you can take a drop, that you can clean your ball during the play of a hole. So if nothing else, Mark your ball so you can take advantage of cleaning it to ensure a better roll. Clean your ball with a towel. Don't wipe it on the green. Now the women are marking their balls, even though it's a little late. To mark your ball, put a ball marker or coin directly behind the ball in line with the hole, and then pick up the ball. Replace it exactly before you remove your mark. The putting green is where your knowledge of etiquette will show up the most and is probably the most crucial. So before we watch any further, let me first explain to you about putting lines. From each player's ball to the hole, there exists an imaginary line which is called their putting line. This line is sacred and not to be walked on or patted down, kind of like a crack in the sidewalk. It is very important that you're always aware of where everyone's balls or their markers are on the green and the corresponding putting line. Do not, under any circumstances, walk in their line. Either walk around their ball or step over their line. This is probably the number one rule of etiquette. The reason being is that by stepping on someone's line, you might mat down the grass and affect the way their putt rolls. Remember, golfers are always looking for something on which to blame their bad shots. Don't let it be you. For the same reason, don't stand in back of someone when they're putting. Most people find it distracting. If you want to see how their putt breaks, watch it from an angle. And be careful not to linger over your putts too long. You're not in a professional tournament, so be aware of keeping play moving. In the line of your putt, you're allowed to move leaves and pebbles and things out of your way. But you're not allowed to smooth down spike marks for fear that you might press down a nice little runway to the hole. You can and should when convenient, however, pat down spike marks you see that are not in your line. Also be sure to repair any divot holes your ball may have made when landing on the green. Do this with either a divot tool or a tee. Pull the grass out and then pat it down. Here I've cleared away a few dead leaves and other debris that are in my line. Notice how I'm careful not to step on the other's lines. Since I'm the furthest, I'll go first. Susan's ball mark is right in the line of my putt, so I've asked her to move it one putter head to the left to get it out of my way. She does this by lining her putter head up with a fixed object and moving the mark from the heel of the putter to the toe. When she replaces her ball, she must replace it exactly as she marked it. The person closest to the hole has the responsibility of taking the flag out. That would be Tracy. But since I can't see the hole from where I am, I've asked her to tend it for me. This means that she'll hold the flag in the hole to mark its position for me and then immediately pull it out after I've taken my stroke so that my ball won't hit it on the green. When tending the flag, stand still and to the side so that your shadow isn't being cast over the hole or distracting the person who's putting. Make sure to hold the flag from flapping if it's windy and work the pin out early so that you can pull it out gently and not damage the hole. Then place it off to the side and out of the way. Well, my putt is just past the hole. 
Since I just hit and am fairly close, I have the option to finish out the hole, which helps speed up play. Because this is a relatively easy putt, I'll go ahead and knock it in. But I'm still careful not to step on the other's line or step too close to the hole. Now it's Melanie's turn. She needs a little more brushing up on her knowledge of the rules because she's not allowed to pat down those spike marks in her line. That will cost her another two strokes. This is why it's important that you lift your feet and don't drag your spikes on the putting green. Boy, she really missed that putt and has hit the flag stick. Now, Tracy didn't put the flag far enough out of the way. It should never be directly behind the hole from anyone's putt for exactly this reason. Unfortunately for Melanie, she's the one who has to incur the extra two-stroke penalty. If she thought the flag would be in her way, she should have asked for it to be moved. She can move the flag, but must play the ball as it lies. She still has the option to continue putting. And at last, it's in the hole. Notice how Susan has already replaced her ball exactly as she had marked it and looked over her putt so that she's ready to step up and hit it when it's her turn. It's polite to watch the other players putting, but while they're looking over their putts, you should also be looking over yours. Always do what you can to keep play moving. Also, take note of where Susan has placed the other clubs that she brought with her onto the green. When possible, lay your clubs across the flag stick, so in case you forget them, whoever puts the flag back in will help pick them up for you. It's not a bad idea to get name labels for your clubs so they can be more easily returned to you. By the way, if you happen to find a club, a head cover, or any other article on the course, Turn it into the lost and found at the pro shop after your rounds. As Susan hits her putt, Tracy's ready with the flag stick to put it back in the hole. The first one to finish out the hole is responsible for putting the flag back in. The others have politely remained on the green until Susan finishes out the hole as well. Too bad. Susan has accidentally hit the ball twice with her putter. Unfortunately, each hit with the putter counts. Her ball didn't quite reach the hole, but it's so close that it's what we call a gimme in social golf. If your putt is within two feet of the hole, rather than have you putt it out, your foursome can decide to give it to you in order to speed up play. They'll just tell you that the putt is good or to take it away. If a putt is given to you, just pick it up, but you do still have to count it as one stroke. Once you've finished out the hole, look to make sure there are no stray clubs left about then move off the green to the next tee so the group behind you can play out. Don't dilly-dally on the green. Notice how our bags and carts are off to the side of the green, but towards the next tee to save time. Count your scores and mark them down on the next tee. Well, that was quite a disastrous hole. This many problems usually don't arise all in one hole, but now you've got an idea of what to do when you find yourself in one of these situations. We've only touched on some of the more common rules and situations you'll encounter. Normally, you'll play the ball as it lies and the course as you find it. However, sometimes you'll be in a situation where a rule can give you an advantage. And therefore, it's important that you're familiar with the rules and that you carry a rule book with you. You've got no one to blame but yourself for added strokes that you incur by not knowing the rules. Now remember, too, that you can't touch the ball until it's on the green or unless you're dropping it under the rules. If you need to touch it to identify it, you should announce that to the others and give them the opportunity to watch you. Then you must replace the ball exactly. And you can't lift your ball to identify it in a hazard. Help out with housekeeping on the course by replacing your divots and try to leave the course better than you found it. Be a gracious winner or loser and always shake hands at the end of the round. At the end of the round, you'll calculate your net score by figuring in your handicap strokes. The handicap system is designed to equalize players of different abilities. This way, different level players can play together and still enjoy a fair, competitive round of golf. It allows the less experienced player to subtract strokes from their total score. The more experienced a player is, the less strokes he gets to subtract. The number of free strokes allotted to a player is called its handicap index. This number is determined as an average based on the best 10 out of 20 rounds played. Now, Melanie, being the least experienced player in our group, has the highest handicap index, which is a 40. Since I'm a professional, my handicap is zero or scratch. 
So when Melanie and I play together, I have to give her 43 strokes. At the end of the round, my score would be the exact number of times that I hit the ball. Her score would be adjusted by subtracting 40 strokes from her gross score. So if she shot a 112, she'd subtract 40, and her final score would be a 72. If I shot a gross 73, she would have beaten me by one stroke. The handicap system makes everyone still have to play their best game in order to win. Your handicap index is based on par for your course. However, par on every course is different depending on its difficulty. Since golf is a game of fairness and sportsmanship, to ensure that a player coming from a less difficult course is fairly compensated when playing at a more difficult course, there's also a system devised to equate the courses. This is called the slope system. Each course is given a slope number to rate its difficulty. In order for you to play a fair match with players of different levels from different courses, all handicaps need to be adjusted for the difficulty or the slope of the course. There are conversion tables or course handicap tables at all courses where you'll take your handicap index and adjust it for the slope of that course to come up with a specific course handicap for that specific course. Your handicap index is a general measure of your playing ability, while your course handicap is a more specific measure based on the difficulty or the slope of the course that you're playing. Now, golf is traditionally played in groups of four or foursomes, where each person counts his strokes, adjusts for his handicap, then comes up with his net score. This is called stroke play. Quite often, however, foursomes will also play as two-person teams, comparing one team's score against the others. Team play is usually done as a hole-by-hole -hole competition, where each team takes the best score on the hole and compares it to the other team's best score to determine who won the hole. And this is called match play. Whichever team wins the hole goes one up. The amount of strokes by which you win the hole doesn't matter. You can only gain one point per hole. There are many other ways this game can be played, and you should become familiar with some of the different formats you're likely to encounter because you'll be playing with them at some point in your golfing career. I've given you a lot of information in this tape, which can be overwhelming at first, but it's all very useful. So keep this tape as a handy reference guide to refer back to. The more you watch it, the more information you'll derive, and the more your game will benefit. So now you can feel confident to get out there and enjoy all that this wonderful game has to offer. So have fun with it. Keep play moving and don't take it too seriously. Remember, after all, it's only a game.